Welcome to our sixth class on the book of Ecclesiastes. This class was taught on Zoom for the British Bible School on Tuesday, the 5th of May, 2020. And this is a recording of what we presented in that class. As we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes, we are uh, sort of basing around this outline here. Um, we've The first two chapters, he looked at a consideration of wisdom and madness and foolishness. And we're currently in the, the second section there, a consideration of work and wealth. And so we'll be finishing that particular study this week as we go on into chapter 7 in our next class session. The theme, as we've been seeing for this book, can be summed up in the statement that he made in chapter 1, and we've seen forms of that in almost every chapter. Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Uh, this is very much Solomon's search for a meaning in life, and he's doing this through a series of case studies. We've seen these in the first five chapters. In chapter two, we had what's referred to as case study number one. He examines pleasure. He examines human achievement. <clears throat> we got to chapter two. We saw that beautiful poem at the beginning, which is case study number two, that there's a time for everything. In case study number three, we saw the need for justice and uh, Solomon's conclusion that God is going to judge all. And in the fourth case study, uh, which we looked at in our uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, first part of chapter four, an inquiry into exploitation and social injustice. By the way, in each of these, as he's going through them, he's con his conclusion is these are meaningless. This is like chasing after the wind. The last, or the middle of chapter uh, four, uh, loneliness, despite the fact that he'd been successful, and that too was meaningless. We saw last week in chapter five, the fulfilling, uh, looked at fulfilling vows, and we saw that wealth is also meaningless. Of course, we sort of saw some of that previously as well. And that brought us to the end of chapter five and our sixth case study, and that of misery, uh, the misery that hoarding wealth brings. So that's what we've looked at thus far, that's what Solomon has examined. And each time he's discovering that there just is no meaning in life when we center our lives on these things. This, this evening, as we go into a consideration of work and wealth, uh, we're going to be looking at the last part of this particular outline here. And we've already examined the time for purpose and work, how, why and how we work, uh, a futile life and a good life. And in chapter 6, really, he just comes out with life is meaningless. And this particular section will have basically two sections as we're going to look at it. Uh, the first part, and by the way, this is a bit of a depressing chapter, but the first part, he concludes that the stillborn are better off than those leaving, uh, living a meaningless life. And the last part of the chapter really just asks the question, although he doesn't really put it in these terms, is there any meaning to life? So let's examine this middle part of this book as Solomon is searching for a meaning in life and thus far coming up so very, very empty. So in chapter 6, life is meaningless. And the first part here of chapter 6, go look at the stillborn being better off. We're going to read the first six verses. I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, 
Yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place. So this chapter is continuing Solomon's, really his examination of riches, examination of wealth. And it is a bit of a depressing chapter. There's no glimmer of hope we're going to see when we get to the end, as we've seen in some of the previous chapters. Uh, New Time in the Tyndall Commentary describes this as the eighth case study, and he calls it on a common cause of misery despite abundant wealth. Um, And so he really says that's the first two verses is this eighth case study. So Solomon says he's observed something else that he considered an evil under the sun. In fact, the Net Bible translates that misfortune on earth. This is a misfortune on earth. And it's simply this. God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing that he might desire, yet he's unable to enjoy them. Instead, someone else does. A stranger does. Um, Derek Kidner wrote, in the message of Ecclesiastes, at once we're faced with the fact that the power to enjoy God's gifts, which was held before us in chapter 5, verse 19, is itself a gift which may or may not be allotted to us. There are more ways than one of being deprived of it. Now, Solomon does not go into the details as to why this man is not able to enjoy his wealth and somebody else does. We could speculate, though, couldn't we? Uh, Perhaps he died. Maybe that's why he didn't get to enjoy it. Perhaps, as the man in chapter 5, verse 13, uh, he mentioned, maybe he'd lost it all in some bad business venture, bad investment, bad business collapse, or something like that. But for some reason, he's not able to enjoy it. Maybe it's just gone as quickly as he acquires it, as we've also seen in the previous chapter. So Solomon's conclusion to all this is very simple. This is meaningless. Some translations, it's a terrible evil. Or some even have, it's a grave misfortune. I found it interesting that apparently the Hebrew literally says it's meaningless. It's an evil sickness. Interesting, isn't it? An evil sickness. Now, He may be exaggerating a bit here, don't you think? Uh, Derek Kinder says, at this point, we we may protest that life is not by any means as black as this for most people. Normally, we can take the rough with the smooth and find our life still decidedly worth living. I added, obviously, the word still there. Well, Solomon, we might say, Solomon, you're, you're just blowing this out of proportion. But, you know, Solomon could have replied to that objection. He could say, well, he's only speaking of some people. Not all, and some people are like this. That very well could be true. And he could respond that if we're only living for ourselves, that life may be this bleak. And I think we can understand that as well. He moves on in verse 3. This is uh, New Times' um, ninth case study. He entitled it, A Specific Cause of Misery Despite Abundant Wealth. This takes us up through verse 9. But uh, uh, hopefully we can see there's a theme going on here. And that is that abundant wealth does not give a satisfying life. How many times do we think that it does? Because people sort of set their goals of on having an abundance of wealth. But Solomon, who did, uh, says, no, this is not where it's at. This time, as he's looking at the his case study here, he suggests a man could father a hundred children. Now, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. Unless, of course, like Solomon, you had a thousand wives and concubines. 
And maybe he had that many children. We don't know. It does it's not recorded. But he says a father could a man could father a hundred children. He could live many years, but not be satisfied with the good things of life that he had. By the way, that sounds a bit like a self-portrait of Solomon, doesn't it? Both in the number of children, as well as not being satisfied with his life. And we know from the accounts of his life in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, that in his later years, he was involved in idolatry, both in building shrines throughout and around Jerusalem, as well as going with his wives to worship at these shrines. I said this at the, at the, in our first lesson. I would like to think that Ecclesiastes is his account of his getting his life straightened out. Well, the person, his illustration, when he died, he says he might not even have a proper burial. I don't know if Solomon was worried about that or not. But that was something that might not happen. That was important to people. It is today, it was even back then. Uh, by the way, the, the text here, if you read the Net Bible, uh, might indicate the idea that he's living forever. And of course, somebody can't live forever, so maybe it just seems that he was living forever. When Solomon considered this man, um, fathering a hundred children, living, living many years, almost like living forever, and still not satisfied and not even know what's going to happen uh, when, he, when he dies, uh, Solomon believed that a stillborn child would be better off than he was. And he goes on to defend that position. He says, at least the child comes into the world and departs in darkness. He's stillborn. He never does even see the light of day. He never makes a name for himself because he never lives in the world. Yet Solomon says he's going to find more rest than the unsatisfied rich man. Now, he seems to be emphasizing that a stillborn baby would not have to endure pain or anything else for such a long period of time like a man in his illustration is doing. Again, you wonder, is he talking about himself here? I don't know. But this absence of pain or poss possibly absence of extreme discomfort seems to be attractive to Solomon compared to living a painful life. Now, his point is theoretical. If there is a point, a person like this, then he would have a life of despair. And even if the man should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy nothing, what advantage would he have over the stillborn who had nothing to enjoy? Yeah, he wouldn't even be tantalized by it. You may have seen the film The Highlander. In that film, it's a song uh, entitled Who Wants to Live Forever. Uh, the group Queen uh, recorded that for the film. Of course, had a hit with it as well. But, you know, the film well il illustrated the problem of living such a long life. Because for the Highlander, everyone he knew and loved died and left him behind. A Tolkien explored some of that in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, didn't, didn't it? Uh, in the relationship of Aragorn and Erwin. And that's brought out in the books. It's brought out in the films as well. You know, living forever, living extremely long lives, isn't really as satisfying as we think it is, especially if we're left all alone. New Time commented in the Tyndall commentary, even if someone were to achieve all these things, the abundant wealth and popularity of verse 2, the abundant progeny and immortality of verses 3 and 6, the fact that he's not able to enjoy the fruits of his achievement means that all he would have is more mouths to feed without adequate resources, with the ultimate punishment of having to endure this miserable fate for an excruciatingly long time. Now that's the problem, isn't it? So Solomon asks the question, do not all go to the same place. I think here he's thinking about the grave. Don't all die. Does it matter how much we have, how little we have? We're all going to die anyway. Uh, Derek Kidner commented, commented that all this is damaging to any rosy picture of the world. The world itself is made to say to us, in the only language we will mostly listen to, 
this is no place to rest. Uh, the Bible study notes uh, went on to say uh, that the point of verses 3 to 6 is the, that the futility of unenjoyed wealth is worse than the tragedy of being stillborn. See, living a long life is no satisfaction, uh, is no guarantee of having a satisfying life. Uh, Danny Petrillo in the Truth for Today commentator commentary said, Solomon was emphasizing the foolishness and worthlessness worthlessness of a life lived without God. This thought challenges the viewpoint that a long life is evidence of divine favor. Solomon would say that this is not necessarily true. In some cases, longer life just compounds one's misery and adds to a growing list of ways he displeases God. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, that if there is no resurrection from the dead, then our viewpoint may as well be, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. See, the type of life Solomon's describing doesn't give satisfaction. As Paul wrote to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it's in godliness with contentment that we find great gain. The last half of this chapter, beginning at verse 7, it's going to move on from there and just simply, in so many words, ask the question, is there any meaning in life? Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage do the wise have over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. The more the words, the less the meaning. How does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? Derek Kidner, as he began this section in his commentary, wrote, The thoughts and questions of the chapter's final paragraph pick up some issues that have met us earlier. To substantiate the motto of the book, Vanity of Vanities, or as we're seeing in the NIV, Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So as he looks around, Solomon sees that people work, yet it's for nothing more than to have something to eat, and that he never does have enough. Uh, Derek Kinder went on to write that he makes a point which is as real to modern man on his industrial treadmill as to the primitive peasant scraping a bare living from the soil. That he works to eat, for the strength to go on working, to go on eating. Don't you see the vicious circle there? Even if he enjoys his work and his food, the compulsion is still there. His mouth, not his mind, seems to be the master. So, what advantage do the wise have over the fool? Is there any real advantage there? Is the wise person really better off than a foolish one? And he notices they both only exist to survive. In other words, there's not a whole lot of advantage over, over wisdom of wisdom over foolishness. Bible study notes had a good comment here. They said, so what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? The rhetorical question in Hebrew implies a negative answer. The wise man has no absolute advantage over a fool in the sense that both will share the same fate. Of course, ultimately, that's death. Koholeth should not be misunderstood here as denying that wisdom has no relative advantage over folly. Elsewhere, he affirms that wisdom does yield some relative benefits in life. We're going to see that in our next lesson. However, wisdom cannot deliver one from 
death. And that's the problem there, isn't it? Uh, what advantage do the poor have who know how to live before other people? Again, he says, there is no real advantage here. He says, it's better to be able to see than to have an appetite for more. Now, that may be a bit of a strange uh, sentence there for us to understand. Uh, Net Bible tries to make some sense of it. The Net Bible has this. It's better to be content with what the eyes can see than for one's heart always to crave more. That may be the idea that's going on here. That certainly makes a lot of sense to me. But if you think about that, if you're always wanting more, that will take away the beauty of what a person does have. Yeah, if you're always wanting more, you're not going to appreciate what you have. New Time, com, um, quoting a chap named Longman, says, The general idea of the proverb is that what is present in hand is much better than what one only desires but does not have. And Heim comments, that gets to the heart of the matter. And that's true, isn't it? What we actually have that we can enjoy is a whole lot better than what we can only desire. Of course, Solomon says about all that, this too is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. Uh, Derek Kidner wrote that to arrive is, for most of us, better than to travel, hopefully. Hopefully you're going to arrive, of course. The trouble that is that to arrive is, in any ultimate and satisfying sense, beyond our power. Whatever we achieve will melt away as vanity and as striving after wind, whether it is the poor man's self-help or the rich man's success. And he moves on there to, to have a bit of what I would call a bit of fatalism. It sort of slips into a bit of fatalism. NIV expresses it this way. Whatever exists has already been named. Whatever humanity is has been known. Um, Net Bible translates that this way. Whatever has happened was foreordained. What happens to a person was also foreknown. Um, yeah, isn't that the way so, some people look at life? There's an expression I've gotten to hear several times in Scotland that uh, whatever's for you won't, won't go past you or won't go by you. Um, in other words, it's going to happen to you one way or another. Fatalism. Listen, the Bible knows nothing about fatalism, although Solomon's sort of re resorting to some here. Because when you think about it, um, it is very much the way he's looking at it. You're both going to die, so what's the point? It's going to hit you one way or the other. Fatalism is not a biblical point of view. Solomon said out of a bit of despair here, it would seem. He goes on to talk about that no one can, t can contend with someone who is stronger than he is. And by the way, some translations regard this as a statement that men cannot dispute with God, being the one who's stronger. The Net Bible translates it's, it's useless for him to argue with God about his fate because God is more powerful than he is. We sort of see some of that in Job, don't we? Because he was trying to argue with God, but he realized it was pointless because our God was so much more powerful than he was. And I forgot to turn off my clock, so apologies for the clock donging. Danny Petrillo went on to say that man is created with several, several boundaries. Man has to learn to accept some things. We use phrases like, that's just the way it is. And, like it or not, moaning, whining, and complaining cannot change the fact that humans have limitations. And we do, don't we? And there are some things, yeah, we need to just accept that that's the way it is. Not fatalism, but just to accept that that's the way of life. Uh, it goes on to say sort of a couple of proverbs here. The, the more the words, the more it is meaningless. So where's the advantage? The Net Bible translates that one, by the way. The more one argues with words, the less he accomplishes. I think we can see some truth in the way that they've uh, uh, rendered that. Um, but words, can words really stop something from happening? 
Danny Petrillo commented, Can words of man change the world? Smooth words cannot stop the sun's rising, can they? A, smooth, uh, a man may fluently argue that it will not rise, but it will. The one thing that many words might do is increase the futility of life for mankind. Yeah, you can make the best argument in the world as to why an airplane should not be able to take off because of its weight and whatnot. But you get on one and it does take off, doesn't it? We can look at a bumblebee and scientists have argued that there's no way a bumblebee should be able to fly because of the, the bulk, the smallest of the wings and the, the bulk of the body. But it does. So arguments don't always stop something from happening, no matter how logical they are. Um, the only thing it might do is make us uh, see the futility of life, make us see how meaningless things are. Solomon goes on to say, who knows what's good for man while he lives the few days, notice what he says here, the few days of his meaningless life, which pass like a, sh a shadow. Derek Kinder says, so the chapter at this midpoint of the book ends with a string of unanswered questions. Secular man heading for death, swept along by change, can only echo. Who knows what's good? Who can tell man what will be after him? Yeah, who can tell man what will be after him on the earth? We don't know what's going to come after us, do we? We don't know. In fact, we've, we're in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 lockdown right now. And we don't know what's going to be happening next week, let alone we don't know what's going to happen next month and definitely not next year. We don't know where we're going to be in terms of this pandemic. Um, in other words, what Solomon's really saying here is this. If this is what life is about, where is the meaning in life? If it's just all meaningless frustration, where is the meaning in life? Danny Petrillo commented that the preacher is slamming every door except the door of faith. The doors of riches of man's wisdom have been slammed shut. These doors will not lead man to answers in life. He must turn to the door of faith. Now Solomon, by the way, has not gotten there yet, has he? But he's going to get there. But we can look at it from knowing what the ending is. We've got to turn to the door of faith. God can teach man the true value of living. Only he knows what will happen in the future. So, Chapter 6 very much is a depressing chapter. This very much has a depressing end to it. So, let's end on a more positive note. Now, Dan and Petrillo helped with that. But remembering the end of chapter 5, quoting from uh, Hendry in the New Bible Commentary, it's he who is in correspondence with God, he whose chief end it is to glorify God and enjoy Him, can live in the present and enjoy the gifts of God today without anxious thoughts for the morrow. Yeah. See, without God, this life has no meaning and purpose. And that's where Solomon is rapidly arriving in his quest for a meaning in life. Uh, Solomon is showing us that this is true, that without God, there is no meaning. Of course, I believe we've also observed that in life. Here are some lessons that I think we can learn from this particular chapter. Um, I would suggest that uh, having abundance, being wealthy, we can learn does not mean we're going to get to enjoy what we have. Uh, just because we have a lot, just because we may be making a lot of money, doesn't mean we're going to get to enjoy it, doesn't mean that it's going to give us any better lifestyle than otherwise. Uh, we need to be content with what we have. I think we see that coming out in this chapter. The blessings God gives us shouldn't be taken for granted, but should be enjoyed with thankfulness while we have them. As Jesus put it, we need to build our treasures in heaven, not on worldly wealth, and be content with what we have. By the way, another lesson I think we can see in this chapter is that a person can so waste his life that maybe it would be better if he had not been born. Uh, maybe that's something we can take from that earlier bit about uh, the stillborn having a better life. 
And finally, uh, we cannot know what happens beyond this life. Uh, in fact, we can't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone next week or next month. Uh, but you see, with God, we've got a hope for what will go on in the future. Thank you for listening to this, and I hope it's been of, of at least some value. And uh, join us for our next session in which we will explore chapter 7.